Um, so first, I just want to say that our, our program this morning is made possible thanks to the generosity of the Jewish Federation of Western SD Endowment, um, Mark and Susan Goldman, Susan and Bill Firestone, Anne and her bears and, and um, all of the congregations, B'nai Torah, Sinai Bethel, and the Jewish Community Center. This is a, really a nice example of great collaborative work. And I'm grateful for everybody for really caring about the topic and wanting to um, participate and make sure that our community could have a chance to have a thoughtful conversation um, in, with, with Rabbi Danny Gordis. In this week's Torah portion, it's Parshat Korach. And, um, you know, the Torah portion talks, Korach has this rebellion, right? And the rabbis have this conversation about what is, what's a good, what's a machlok, like what's a good discussion? What's a good dispute that's really worth having because it's actually going to further a conversation? And what is a dispute that actually nothing good is going to come of it? And that's actually a really fine distinction. When we were kids, I'm the youngest of four. My father used to always say, enough, I wish you kids wouldn't argue. And the truth is he said that whether we were fighting about who would sit in the front seat or who had, you know, who had to take out the garbage or if we were having like a thoughtful conversation about something, he just didn't like us to disagree. In that regard, my late father was wrong because sometimes there are conversations that can be healthy and spirited and can actually, you can grow from them. And other times those conversations and those disagreements can be destructive and really take you down a very, a very bad path. The truth is when it comes to Israel, I think that sometimes there are really healthy conversations and healthy disputes that help us understand Israel better and that help us understand the complexity of the situation. And other times the disputes, the intention is actually destruction. And I, I think that um, Dr. Danny Gordis is one of these people who really has an eye on what are good conversations about the state of Israel that come out of a place of love and come because we care and we want to grow and we want to expand ourselves. And what are conversations that really ultimately are intended to lead to the demise of the state or the destruction of the state? And I think Danny always she always frames his conversation in a place that comes from deep love and he wants to further the conversation and at the same time he's he's a no-nonsense like he, he doesn't tolerate silliness and I I've, I don't know if I appreciated it when I was a student at the University of Judaism but now I certainly do. Um, Dr. Danny Gordas is a senior vice president in court distinguished fellow at the Shalom College. He's written many books 12 the truth of the matter is they're all, each of them is, is good in, in their own way and offer different unique in, in insights. He was in our community most recently in November. It was like a lifetime ago. It was November before COVID when he talked about his book, We Stand Divided, The Rift Between American Jews and Israel. It's really my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gordas and to um, have him help us understand what's going on better. In terms of format, I'm going to keep you all muted. If you have questions, I want to invite you to put them in the chat. I will monitor the chat, and I promise that we will leave time for me to, to share some of your questions. Okay, with that, thank you. Danny, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Rabbi Katz. Uh, Amy, we've been we've been friends for a very long time, so um, it's really a delight to, to be with you again and to be with your community. And I want to thank all of those people in the various synagogues, the Federation, all the various people who made this conversation possible. It is actually a wonderful thing to see so many different arms of a community gathering together to, to make a conversation possible. You would be surprised how not easy that is in many places. I'm sure it wasn't terribly easy here, but um, it's really extraordinary that your community can do this. And I'm really very honored uh, to be asked to spend a little bit of time with you thinking about some of the issues related to what's going on in Israel today. So let me say what it is that I would like not to address in the formal part, though I'm more than happy to talk about it in the informal part of the Q&A, and we'll leave plenty of time for that. Um, I don't want to get into right now the whole question of kind of the long-term background of what led to the recent violence between Israel and Hamas, or the more particular, what I'm calling the factors that led to a perfect storm in the days leading up to the beginning of the fighting three or four weeks ago. In the chat, just a couple of minutes ago, and for those of you that are not uh, yet comfortable with chat, Rabbi uh, Katz is gonna send it out in an email to her congregation. But if you want, you can cut and paste from the chat 
where I've put in two links to two videos that I, they're free, they're just out there on YouTube. Uh, they're both very brief, like each one is maybe 10, 12 minutes. I'm just trying to give people a very clear sense of how did we get where we are, talking about what led to the conflict, did that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we're not going to talk about that in the formal part, but again, as I said, if you would like to address that in the question and answer, more than happy to. Uh, I'll also say that uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what's going on in Israel at this very moment, except to say that this is a very tense day, and this is going to be uh, 10 nail-biter days. Uh, as you know, there is a coalition that has been put together. It's a very strange coalition. Um, People are feeling betrayed. People on the right, for example, who voted for Naftali Bennett, thinking that he was a right winger, which he said he was, uh, feel betrayed by Bennett, that he has joined together with left wing Jewish parties like Meretz and Labor and an Arab party called Ra'am, which is distinctly anti the existence of a Jewish state, by the way, which makes it strange bedfellows for Bennett. Uh, there's all kinds of cries out there to do everything, as Rabbi Druckmann put it uh, earlier this week. Uh, do everything you can to, to make sure that that coalition does not become a government. Uh, that led the GSS, the Shin Bet, the Shabak, whatever you want to call it, which is one of Israel's central security services, to say that they are very worried about the possibility of incitement and actual violence. Uh, Naftali Bennett and Ayala Chakade have been given Shin Bet security in addition to police security. Uh, this is a scary time here, uh, and where this is going to go is very unclear. There's also a tentatively scheduled, rescheduled flag march around Jerusalem, which was supposed to happen on Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day, which got canceled or more or less canceled uh, the day that the fighting broke out, that, that very famous Monday afternoon four weeks ago. Uh, it's been rescheduled for this Thursday, and there are very great worries that if that march does go ahead, uh, there could be violence there too. So this is a very tense time in Israel. We can talk about some of the immediate issues around today, uh, if you, and if you'd like, in the, in the Q&A. Um, but uh, that's not what I want to talk about um, during the formal part, and I'll get to that in one second. And the last thing I'll point out, and I'm sure that Rabbi Katz either has sent this out or will send this out, uh, but I've been writing a, a series of essays about what's been going on. Didn't do this for many, many years, but kind of re revived it, um, given the, the urgency and the importance of what's happening. And those can all be found uh, online at danielgordas.substack. Dot com. So uh, it's really very simple, danielgordas.substack.com, or you can just Google Substack and Daniel Gordas and it'll pop up. And all of those issues, uh, all those columns are there for you to take a look at. Now, what I'd like to talk about today has to do not with the longstanding issues that led to the conflict or the issues that created the perfect storm or the tensions inside Israel around possible violence, the question of whether or not this potential coalition is going to become a real government. What I want to talk about is another issue that we've all been keeping our, our eyes on, which is the reaction of American Jews in particular to what's happened in Israel in the last three or four weeks. There's been a strong reaction from large swaths of American Judaism, and it's not monolithic by any means, obviously. It, 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 it obviously has spread across a wide spectrum. Uh, and there's been a wide array of uh, responses from governments around the world. Some governments in Europe actually flew an Israeli flag over the parliament. Uh, whereas other governments were unrelentingly critical. And I'll just say, by the way, without getting into American politics at all, that the people in the know in Israel were actually quite pleased with Biden. Um, some people were nervous about Biden's election. Some people were not nervous about Biden's election. Israelis were, you know, disagreed the way that Americans disagreed about Trump, about Biden and all of that. Uh, but Biden may have had a slight misstep at the very beginning, but essentially during the course of the entire war, uh, the United States was solidly in defense of Israel's right to defend itself. Uh, and while some Israelis would have loved to have seen it be more Trump-like, you know, kind of an open credit card, a, a blank check, well, that was never going to happen really with any president um, that was going to follow the previous president. And I think most Israelis in the know, it's just worth saying, actually thought that Biden did a fairly decent job. If you remember, Blinken said that he had received no indication from Israel about why it had taken down the AP building in Gaza and that he was disturbed about that. Israel then provided him information. The rumor on the street is that Israel provided Blinken with proof that in that AP building, in that journalism building, uh, was equipment that Hamas was using to try to jam Iron Dome. 
Now, if they could have jammed Iron Dome, obviously then Israeli citizens in Tel Aviv and Ashdod and Ashkelon would have been sitting ducks. And that's why Israel took down the building. It's important to note that once Israel provided that information, uh, Blinken said not another word, didn't say at all anything about wanting greater explanation of why Israel took the building down. So that seems to have been the reason. Well, obviously, it'll come out in greater detail down the, down the road. Uh, but again, just as a long-winded way of saying that basically people were fairly pleased with how the Biden administration acquitted itself during those weeks. Of greater concern, though, is the issue that arose among many American Jews, especially many young American Jews. And what I'd like to try to reflect with you about a little bit today is how are we to explain this really unprecedented vitriol against Israel when Israel is defending itself against Hamas? And I want to make a distinction, of course, between Hamas and the Palestinians who live in Gaza. It's true that Hamas was elected by the Palestinians who live in Gaza, but that was a long time ago. Uh, and Palestinians in Gaza really have no good options. If they protest against Hamas, they end up dead. Uh, and they know that. So there's very, very little political objection or public objection or social media objection to Hamas. Hamas rules Gaza with an iron fist. And so when I say Hamas, I'm not talking about all the Palestinians in Gaza, of whom there are millions. And um, there are, there's no question that the Palestinians in Gaza live a fairly miserable life, unfortunately. And I don't know a single Israeli who doesn't wish that their lives were infinitely better, both because they're human beings and because, quite frankly, if their lives were better, um, they would probably not want to risk everything that they have, and we might have less conflict with Hamas. But when I'm talking about Hamas, I'm talking about the terror organization. It was a battle between the state of Israel and a terrorist organization, which is sworn on its, to the, its commitment to destroy the state of Israel. That was always the case, and that's still the case. And that's critically important to remember. After our conversation today, you can go online, you can Google the Hamas Charter, and you will see in all kinds of different places where it talks about liberating all of Palestine. Liberating all of Palestine does not mean reaching territorial compromise with the Jewish state. Liberating all of Palestine means there's no state of Israel, period. That's what the this war was about. This war was not about an occupation. This war was not about the embargo of, of Gaza by Israel. This war was not about anything other than Hamas is the latest iteration of a series of parties that have been our neighbors for 70-something years, really more like 100 years, uh, who, are, who are sworn on the destruction of what we call the Jewish state, what we call the state of Israel. Now, given that fact, it's actually, to me, kind of strange and actually more important it's it's very sad it's actually heartbreaking the way in which many particularly young but not exclusively young american jews responded to this conflict and the way in which they reacted towards israel's conduct of the of the conflict uh, so i'll just remind you that some of us had occasion to speak uh, uh, november before the outbreak of covid about the book that i wrote about the relationship between american jews and israel called we stand divided uh, and in that book I basically made the argument there are a number of fundamental differences between American Jews and Israel. I'm just going to review them very quickly for those people who either weren't there or have forgotten, but then I want to move forward and suggest that while I still stand by what I wrote in the book, I've actually come to think about this a little bit differently than I did back then because I think things have changed. In the book, I argued that really American Judaism and Israeli Judaism by this point are really very different animals in a lot of ways. We have always, both sides, American Jewish leadership and Israeli leadership, when we talk to each other, we've always stressed the ways in which we have a tremendous amount in common. We're both democracies, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is true. Uh, but the reality is that Israel and America have become very, very different projects. And I'm just going to remind you quickly of some of the points that come up uh, in that book. So the first one was, the difference between what I would call universalism and particularism. So if you go to the bottom of the Statue of Liberty and you read the poem, The Great Colossus, then what it says is, give me your tired, your poor, your, right, your teeming masses yearning to breathe free. It doesn't say your white teeming masses, your European teeming masses, your Catholic teeming masses, your Christian teeming masses, your heterosexual teeming masses. It just says, give me your teeming masses yearning to breathe free. America was a project for all of humanity. 
not a particular race, not a particular religion, not a particular ethnicity, not a particular sexual orientation, not a particular anything. America was a project for all of humanity. And if you wanted to join in with America and you wanted to embrace the ideals that was going that were going to make America a great republic, then America wanted you. And that's what Emma Lazarus's poem at the foot at, at the foot of the Statue of Liberty really uh, suggests. As noble as that sentiment is, though, of course, that's not what Israel was ever meant to be. What the United Nations voted on on November 29th, 1947, was the creation of what they called a national home for the Jewish people. Now, it's true that in the next paragraph of the Balfour Declaration, it says that nothing should be done to in any way impinge on the rights of those peoples already living there. That's a thousand percent true. But it's important to understand that the United Nations itself, when it voted in November 47, it said that the idea of this place was to be a national home for the Jewish people. That's why, for example, the American Declaration begins when in the course of human events, in Jefferson's words, because it's human events, whereas the Declaration of the State of Israel, the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, written by a variety of people, but heavy-handedly edited by, by David Ben-Gurion, says, Be'eretz Yisrael kam ama Yehudi. The Jewish people was born in the land of Israel, not in the course of human events, but the Jewish people and the land of Israel. Israel was always meant to be the nation state of the Jewish people, not teeming masses yearning to breathe free wherever they may come from and whoever they might be. Now, clearly, Israel was always committed to giving completely equal rights to people who were already citizens and live in this country. But it is, a to paraphrase Lincoln and badly butcher Lincoln, it is a country basically of the Jews, by the Jews, and for the Jews. And in that regard, Israel and America are really very, very different projects. We didn't talk about that very much as an American Jewish community 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, but we're talking about it more and more. And I think for a younger generation of American Jews, that's a more difficult pill to swallow than we might have imagined. That's one major issue. Another major issue, of course, is that in the, in the eyes of diaspora Jews, not only American Jews, but European diaspora Jews, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, even in elsewhere, what was being built here, and I'm of course sitting in Jerusalem at the moment, what was being built here was meant to be some sort of idealized form of Jewish life. Think about how excited American Jews got about the kibbutzim, right? This normal socialist enterprise, you know, they had this image that they farmed the land during the day and they sat around the campfire at night, somebody played the accordion and everybody danced around. It's not exactly how the kibbutzim really ever worked, um, but American Jews, among many others, had a kind of a very idealized vision of what the Jewish state should be. History, though, is hardly idealized. History is hardly idyllic. History is a messy business. And the business of the Jewish people getting back into the business of statehood, of government, of being actors in history is invariably a messy business. It's a messy business for the United States which has actually been not at war for only a handful of years in all of its history. You can check that out. It's been a messy business for all European countries. In other words, history is a mess, and it invariably involves doing things that are sometimes very complicated, sometimes morally gray. Uh, different leaders make different sorts of decisions, but Israel is in a very messy part of the world, and the Jewish people and the Jewish state being involved in the messiness of history is somehow at odds with this idealized version that we had of Zion uh, in writings of Zionist leaders and American Jewish leaders and so forth. So ideal Zion meeting up with the messiness of history has been another complicating factor. Another way in which Israel and America are different, and this may be changing by the way, but until relatively recently, I think it would have been fair to say that for Jews in America, Judaism is a religion. There are other parts, there's a culture, it could be nationalist if they were Zionists and all that, but fundamentally what Judaism was, was a religion. So in America, if you say complete this phrase, Jews and, the completion of the phrase is Christians, Jews and Christians. Whereas in the Middle East and in Israel, Judaism obviously has a religious component and there are many Jews who take the religious dimension of Judaism very seriously, but if you were to ask Israelis to complete the phrase Jews and, they certainly won't say Jews and Christians. They won't even say Jews and Muslims. What they'll say is Jews and Arabs, because fundamentally here, it's a matter of ethnicity or of nationhood or of peoplehood. And that brings out all different sorts of ways of 
lawmaking and government making and behaving and so on and so forth. And we don't have time to go into that right now, though, again, happy to address that later on. Uh, but the difference between Judaism as religion and Judaism as peoplehood is yet another difference. And finally, I'll just say that America is really a liberal democracy. This takes off back from the issue of uh, universalism versus particularism. Right? But America is a liberal democracy. If in 70 years, um, America is mostly Hispanic and Congress is therefore mostly Hispanic and America has elected a Hispanic president, uh, is that a failure or a success of American democracy? And I think most of us would say that's a complete success of American democracy. That's what American democracy was meant to be. But what about here? What about if in 70 years, Israel's mostly Arab and the Knesset is mostly Arab and the prime minister is an Arab woman or man? Is that a failure or a success of Israel's democracy? Now, it's clearly a success of the apparatus of Israel's democracy, but though this will be hard for some people to swallow, I think what has to be said is it would be a failure of the enterprise that we call the state of Israel. We want to be, we're committed to being a democracy, but we're not a democracy that's ethnic blind in quite the way that American democracy is. And so this is more what we call not a liberal democracy, but an ethnic democracy, to use the words of Sammy Smua, a professor at Haifa University. And that's another major difference that I think also is difficult, especially for young American Jews when they look at how different Israel is from America, not how similar it is. And that I think is a series of issues that has made this relationship very complicated. But let me just say something now for a few minutes about what I think has changed even in the couple of years since uh, We Stand Divided was published. And what I've noticed really in the last several weeks since this war was fought, here's what I think is happening. I think that a younger generation of American Jews is reading the situation in the Middle East, especially with Israel and Gaza, but not only. They're reading the situation in the Middle East through the eyes of American identity politics. In other words, in America now, identity politics is all the rage, right? There are people who are empowered, people who are not empowered. There are white-skinned people, there are darker-skinned people. Uh, and they would, you can translate that into the Middle East. There's people that have a state, there's people that don't have a state. There's people that have high tech that they can meld with their army, like Israel, and there's people that don't have really standing armies and certainly don't have much high tech to meld with it. It's the haves and the have nots. And the haves and the have nots in American life is a huge issue that requires recalibration. In American ways of thinking, there are lots of groups, Hispanics, African Americans, LGBTQ, lots of other people who have been the have nots. And America is in the throes of a series of social revolutions right now in which people are saying, and women too, by the way, that's very important to mention also with the Me Too movement, right? There's a lot of different groups from, again, some of them are racial, some of them are gender, some of them are ethnic, but they're all saying we want what's coming to us. And it's the powerless and the stateless and the non-privileged who are now going to have their turn. And when you take those lenses and you look through those lenses at the Middle East, well, then what you say is obviously the Palestinians are the Blacks or the Palestinians are the Hispanics or the Palestinians are the LGBTQ or the Palestinians are the women. And Israel is the opposite side of each of those spectra, which I think is fundamentally false. And to take that notion of American politics and apply it to the Middle East and to apply it to Israel is to set up an understanding of this conflict that I think will invariably lead you down that rabbit hole of seeing Israel as immoral and wrong. And I want to try to suggest a couple of things that I think are fundamentally wrong about taking that American lens about power, critical race theory, new revolutions, and so on and so forth, and applying it to the Middle East. Uh, the first thing that I think that that analysis does wrong is that it leads, leaves out the category of good versus evil. We don't really talk about evil very much in America anymore. I mean, obviously, Ku Klux Klan, some other horrible things, of course we do. Uh, but I think that good and evil is a, is, a set of, is a set of terms that people find kind of quaint. You don't hear it spoken about all that much. Uh, and so therefore, when you want to try to figure out who's right and who's wrong, you don't look at the cause, but you look at the facts on the ground. And so Israel suffered 12 or 13 dead 
and Gazans suffered several hundred dead, the overwhelming majority of whom, by the way, were involved in Hamas as a terror organization. But even if we leave that aside, they had several fold the number of dead in Israel. So by definition, right, it was an unfair conflict and Israel must have done something wrong. But how much sense does that actually make? The Allies killed 500,000 German civilians in Germany during the Second World War. Only, and I use that word very ironically, only 70,000 Brits died during the Blitz. Virtually zero Americans died on American soil because of the Second World War. So if you were to look at the numbers, half a million innocent Germans or German civilians die, zero Americans die, and again, quote unquote, only 70,000 Brits die, it would seem to be the same thing as here. So does that mean that the Allies were wrong? Obviously, that's absurd. The reason it's absurd is because one has to look at how did the conflict get started and what were the two sides each trying to accomplish? Germany was trying to take over the world. The allies were trying to defend democracy. What's going on between Israel and Gaza? I'm going to oversimplify, but this is basically correct. Israel is still fighting a war for its right to exist. And Hamas is fighting Israel to say that Israel has no right to exist. That's the end of the story. Now, if you believe, as I do, that the future of the Jewish people depends in large measure, not exclusively, but in large measure, on the survival and the flourishing of the Jewish state, then what Hamas is trying to do is to make it impossible for the Jewish people to flourish and to survive the way that we want it to. To me, that's evil versus good. To me, Israel defending itself is a clear-cut case of good defending itself against evil, just as the allies defending themselves against Nazi Germany was a clear cut case of good defending itself against evil, even if we killed several fold more of their innocent civilians than they killed of ours. Those are all tragic deaths, obviously. But at the end of the day, the numbers on the ground say nothing about right and wrong. And people have been looking at the imbalance of numbers and saying, well, therefore, it wasn't a fair fight. I'm not quite sure what fair fight means. Israel should stop using Iron Dome so that Israeli civilians will be sitting ducks and they'll get killed and then the numbers will be even. And then somehow it's more fair. Not really quite really sure what that means. Um, but that's the first thing that I would notice, that, that I would note, that looking at this conflict through the lens of American identity politics takes us to a very strange moral place, which I think is actually an immoral place. The second of the three points that I want to make, and then I'll wrap up, is that I think we have to also remind ourselves what Zionism is. I mean, what is this, what is this movement called Zionism? What's it about? Now, you could say that it's the drive to create a Jewish state. That's true. But Zionism is actually something much more important. And we never talk about it this way, but we should. Zionism is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. The difference between Zionism and other national liberation movements, like the Chechnyans and the Basques and the Kurds, or other liberation movements, even if they're not national, like African Americans, like Hispanics, like women, like LGBTQ, and so on and so forth. The difference between those and Zionism is that Zionism has been ridiculously successful. I mean, when you compare what was in this country 73 years ago to what's here now, this far outshines anything that the founders of this state could have imagined or hoped for in their wildest dreams. It's not perfect. We have huge problems. There are tensions here that could explode into violence, even among Jews, which keeps me, literally keeps me up at night. So this is not to say that it's all done and, you know, all signed and sealed and delivered. It's not. Uh, but it's still a, a project successful beyond anyone's imagination back in the day. Uh, and therefore, what's sad to me is that Black Lives Matter looks at Hamas, which executes LGBTQ people, which executes people who disagree with it politically, which executes people who are critical of it on social media, and say Black Lives Matter stands with Hamas. Really? Well, what about Hamas do you stand with? Is it about nation their national liberation? To have national liberation, all they have to do is say, we recognize the right of the state of Israel to exist, and we want to now discuss borders. That's a conversation to have, but that's not a conversation they're willing to have. And what Black Lives Matter does not acknowledge is that the state of Israel is also the product of a national liberation movement called Zionism. One of the tragedies of Zionism is that it's been too successful. One of the tragedies of Zionism is that a young generation of Jews can no longer imagine a Jewish people without a state. 
A young generation of Jews can no longer imagine a Jewish people when there are Jews having to flee someplace but have nowhere to go. Like the thousands of people in France are now beginning to wonder whether it's time to leave France. And France is not the last country that's going to go down that path of becoming uninhabitable for Jews. You can think of some of the other ones as well. So if the first point was that I think this notion of looking at the Middle East through the lenses of American identity politics leaves out categories of good and evil, it also misrepresents what Israel is. It talks about Israel as a colonialist project and so on and so forth. Uh, to be a colonialist project, by the way, you have to be sent by someone to colonize something. Who sent the Jews to colonize this? That, that was not, nothing of the sort. Plus, we were coming back to our ancestral homeland. It's a whole long conversation. But as I said, the second one is that nobody talks about Zionism as what it is, which is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. And here's the third and final point I'll make about this. And then I'll wrap up and we'll open it up for Q&A. When I watched the horrible events unfolding in America, around the horrible death of George Floyd and then the rioting in Portland and Seattle and other places around America. I was reminded of my mom in 1968, taking me to downtown Baltimore to see the burned out buildings after the riots in Baltimore in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And that led me to remember when we took our own daughter who was then probably three or four years old to see the burnt out buildings in downtown Los Angeles, where we were then living uh, after Rodney King. And now that same daughter, who's a grown up, took her daughter, who's a new young child, uh, to parts of Boston where there was no rioting, but there were stores boarded up in case there was rioting to explain to her what was going on in America. My mother took me to see it. I took my daughter to see it. My daughter took her daughter to see it. Does anybody really imagine that if we're all fortunate to live a long time when we get together on a call like this in 30 years, that the problems of race in America are gonna be behind us? Does anybody really think we're about to solve the problem of race in America? We're not. We have to try to make it better. We may disagree about how to do that. We may disagree about what fairness looked like. That's all good, that's fair. But we all agree, I think, that we have to fix some of the things that are very wrong. But I think we should also agree we're not going to put that problem behind us. And what I, I hoped as I watched this horror unfolding, I was, of course, in Israel because it was during COVID. Uh, I watched this horror unfolding from far away. I did say to myself wistfully, I wonder if some Americans are now going to begin to remember that every society has problems that simply don't have a solution. You can work on fixing them, and you have to work on fixing them, and you have to do your utmost to make them better, but you can't ultimately fix them. Right now, the Israeli-Arab conflict, I believe, is in that category. It is not my ideal state of affairs for Israel to control millions of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza in different kinds of ways. We control them in different ways, even inside the West Bank, and that's even different from Gaza, but it's not an ideal situation. And it's not an ideal situation for our kids to grow up having to run to bomb shelters when they're playing in playgrounds. And it's not an ideal situation for Tel Aviv to have been missiled and rocketed a few weeks ago. And it's not an ideal situation for young kids in Gaza to be fearful of Israel, just as our kids are fearful of, of, of them and so on and so forth. There's nothing good about this conflict. This conflict is horrible, and I hope that we can make it better. But those people who imagine that we could just make this conflict go away if Israel only did the right thing should ask themselves, is race as a problem going to go away in America if America only does the right thing? What's the right thing? And is that right thing going to make the problem go away? I suspect that it will not. So what I want to suggest is not, I am nothing that I'm saying here is, is meant to be in the wildest imagination a claim that everything that Israel does is right, or that Israel has conducted each of these conflicts the way that it should have. These conflicts are very, very complicated. But at the end of the day, I do believe that the state of Israel, which has never been granted or never been said about it, that the people around it accept its right to exist, Israel has a right to defend its right to exist. And when entities that are sworn on our destruction attack us, we are going to defend ourselves. And if they have chosen to put their military capabilities in the middle of civilian areas, which is what Hamas does, then civilians are gonna get killed and it is going to be tragic, but it is not gonna make Israelis think twice 
about whether or not we should go down with the ship. That's just not a conversation that Israelis are having right or left. And I think it would also be useful, and I'll say this just by way of conclusion, it would be useful for American progressives and especially for American young progressives who are so relentlessly critical of Israel, it would be useful if they asked themselves, wait a minute, why are Israeli progressives not assailing the government? Why did Israeli progressives not call for the army to stop the campaign in Gaza? Why did Israeli progressives not call for an investigation of the army or the political echelon? How come they went along with it? Well, because they live in Tel Aviv. Many of them in Tel Aviv was being rocketed. And Israeli progressives take great offense at having their children be the target of rockets. They understand that this is not a right-wing, left-wing issue. This is actually, do we have a right to live issue? And in this regard, by the way, the left and right in Israel are actually very, very aligned. I don't believe, and by way of conclusion, I don't think we're going to get to a place where American Jews and Israelis agree about everything. Not only are we not going to get there, I don't think we should get there. Uh, as Rabbi Katz pointed out at the beginning of our conversation, there are, there are disagreements, machlokot, as we call them in Jewish tradition, that are actually worth having. And the Talmud is a 2,700-page argument. Between, there's not a single page practically in which there's not different views between different people. And our tradition sought not to preserve the right answer or the, right, the answer that won the day, so to speak, but it's sought to preserve the conversations because the conversations were by and large, most of the time, fairly respectful. They were insightful. They were intellectually very kind of acute. Uh, and the sense of Jewish tradition was, is that's how we all learn. So I don't even aspire for a time when American Jews and Israelis agree about everything. Because the minute that we agree about everything, we really don't have anything to teach each other. But what I do aspire to is a younger generation of American Jews and some older American Jews as well, who as much as their heart breaks for what's happening to the Palestinians, by the way, as does mine, and as do the hearts of many of my Israeli friends, not all, but many of my Israeli friends. What I would hope and pray is that at the end of the day, even as their hearts break for what's happening this time in Gaza and at a different time it could be somewhere else, that they understand that this is not about 1967 or occupation or anything else. This is really still about 1948. Do we have a right to have a state? And are we willing to defend ourselves at all costs in order to preserve it? I believe that we do have a right to have a state. The United Nations said that. The international community said that. I think history made it clear that the Jews dare not be without a state. And I hope and pray that the day will come when our neighbors will also get there. Egypt got there. Jordan got there. The United Arab Emirates got there. Bahrain got there. Sudan's moving. Morocco's moving. Saudi Arabia's moving. When the Palestinians can begin to do what other Arab countries are beginning to do, this is a region that will begin to know peace. And it's a region in which children on both sides will have a much brighter future than they do now. And hopefully that will be a period in which it's easier for the two sides of this divide, American Jews and Israelis, to see eye to eye. Uh, but until that time comes, I hope that American Jews, like Israelis, will understand that the core of this issue is the question of whether or not the Jews have a right to a state, whether or not the Jewish state has the right to survive. So I'll stop with that and pass the baton back to Rabbi Katz, and thank you for your attention. So um, thank you, that was really great. If some of you want to put some questions in the chat, I invite you to do so. Um, I actually want to start by asking you, so what advice do you have to those of us who want to try and, and encourage healthy conversation that will, lead to, that will lead to a growth for both the American community and Israel? Like, how do I help people engage in a healthy, in a, in a, in a thoughtful way about Israel, understanding that complexity, it used to be take them there to see, but like, what can we do if you can't afford a trip to Israel? What can I do to continue to show my love of Israel and at the same time grapple with the issues and help my congregants do that? It's a great question. Uh, one of the things that I would say is we need to know a lot more. I mean, for example, when the New York Times runs a headline that talks about evictions and Sheikh Jarrah, uh, what's that about? But Israel just picked up one day and decided, oh, we're going to give these houses to Jews and we're going to throw the Arabs out and that's it. If that's the case, if it's so blatant, how did it make its way to the Supreme Court? In other words, so I actually interviewed uh, on my Substack um, 
feed, whatever it's called these days, a civil rights attorney in Israel who actually specializes in Palestinian residents' rights. He's a Jewish man uh, who cares a great deal about Palestinians and their rights. And he explained the law of why these evictions may be taking place. And when you listen to him, and obviously, given what he does for a living, you can pretty much figure out where his heart is. But he explained very clearly why the law is actually on the side of those people, i.e., in this particular case, the Jews, who do have property deeds to those houses. We simply have to know more. I think that it's unfortunate that the vast majority of people of a certain age and younger, and I'll leave it to you to determine what that number might be, have not, really have not read one single history of the state of Israel from cover to cover. You can't learn this conflict from Twitter. And you can't learn this conflict from Instagram or Facebook or on little screenfuls of information. You have to sit down and read books. And uh, I'm actually going to be posting a list of some books that I think people should read just to get a good a good background. So but I'm going to interrupt and just tell read. people that your book is really the one that I recommend to people because it's both readable and thorough. So you're not going to say it, but I am going to say that. And I just need to put that out there. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm not going to disagree with you, but in any event, uh, I do appreciate it. Um, but that's why I wrote the book, by the way. I wrote the book because I thought, look, there's some excellent, the other excellent histories about um, about the state of Israel. But this one was meant to be really readable, almost like a kind of a novel, so to speak. I mean, accurate, historically accurate and all of that, but very, very readable. And I appreciate the plug. But if it's mine or not mine, it doesn't really matter. So you should learn about Hamas. What does Hamas stand for? Where did Hamas come from? Um, you should learn to understand all of these various kinds of issues. Ask yourself, if Israel is so, if so, such a cause for evil in the Middle East, why did the UAE just sign the normalization agreement with Israel? Why did, by the way, Bahrain and the UAE, neither of them recall their ambassadors during the war? Why did neither Egypt nor Jordan call the, recall their ambassadors or call the Israeli ambassador in for a, you know, a talking to, which is part of how the diplomatic world works? to express their displeasure. They didn't express any displeasure. We should ask ourselves that. Do you realize where we are? We're in a place where actually Egypt and Jordan and Bahrain and the UAE were more supportive of Israel during this war than young American progressive Jews. Now that's crazy. But I would say it's partly because they understand this region much better than people who live across the ocean who understandably never really had reason to study it. So I would say that under your leadership and the leadership of other rabbis in the community, the most important thing is to study, to study and to learn. And by the way, read Palestinian literature too. Read Palestinian histories, read uh, Rashid Khalidi, read, read all sorts of people who disagree with a lot of what Israelis say, who have a very different take, but are serious historians and have what to say. Um, so I think the most important thing for us at this time is to learn and to approach the facts of history with an open mind. Then we may not all agree about how to proceed, but I think we can have a very, very different kind of conversation, much less dependent on histrionics and much more dependent on kind of sage discussion among various people based on a more or less agreed upon set of facts. So Annette Weinshank, you have your hand up. If you want to unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Sure. Uh, actually, I, I put it. I put it in the chat. Uh, well, actually, two. One is um, Iran, which uh, which you haven't mentioned is a, a spoiler, uh, and the other is a, a recent YouTube uh, that I saw of a stand with us uh, impromptu uh, Q and A with students at UCLA, uh, and there was you know multiple choice of you know well, which which is the only democracy in the Middle East, Israel, Iran, Iraq, whatever, and they thought and they thought and they said uh, Iran. Uh, Iran, you know, Hamas was on the eight. Uh, they were very serious and very, you know, very respectful. They knew absolutely, truly, shockingly, less than nothing because it was, uh, it was all wrong. Yeah. So the second question, of course, goes right back to what I said in response to the first one. People just don't know, and uh, that's true. You know, UCLA, you need a four point oh plus something uh, to get into UCLA these days. Um, and they're smart kids and they just don't know anything. So, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. It's just, it's based on a lot of ignorance. And again, when you take ignorance and you read it through the lenses of American identity politics, then by definition, the strong must be the wrong and the weak must be the right and so on and so forth. Now, Iran, I didn't mention, and you're right that I didn't, and I appreciate your raising it. Uh, I didn't mention it because it's not really 100% germane to this latest conflict. Now, 
The Islamic Jihad, which is one of the terrorist organizations inside the Gaza Strip, is a direct, directly controlled entity by Iran. I would say that Hamas is more or less in Iran's orbit. Iran clearly was hoping to stu stir the pot here. Iran was clearly hoping to create some trouble. Uh, but Iran did not actually launch this attack in the way that, for example, if it calls up Nasrallah in Lebanon and says, unleash those hundreds of thousands of rockets that are much more powerful and much more precise that they have in Lebanon than they have in Gaza, that's directly Iran's doing. And Iran may do that one day. They're not going to do it so fast because they know they have one shot. Israel's made it clear, left-wing people, right-wing people, Israel's made it clear that when Hezbollah does attack Israel, southern Lebanon will look like a moonscape when it's done. It'll just be over. Now, Iran therefore has one shot, and they're holding that shot probably in abeyance in case Israel attacks Iran to destroy the nuclear reactor. Uh, and Israel, at a certain point, will do whatever it needs to do to uh, make sure that Iran does not get a nuclear weapon. Some of you are probably aware that it's called the Begin Doctrine. When Begin, in June 1981, attacked the reactor at Osirak, uh, he said, no standing enemy of the Jewish state is ever going to be allowed to accumulate a weapon of mass destruction. He didn't call it the Begin Doctrine, but others did. El Olmer bombed a nuclear reactor that was being built in Syria. Uh, with the American government's knowledge, it's not exactly approval, but with the American government's knowledge. Uh, Israel has clearly been up to all sorts of things to make it difficult for Iran to move forward. Ships sinking, centrifuges spinning out of control, explosions in various places. You're following the news as much as I am. These aren't accidents. Uh, this is Israel doing what it can to slow them down. Uh, but it's very clear that Israel will, at a certain point, if it appears that Iran's about to go nuclear, I don't know what they can do. I mean, they don't talk to me, and that's good. Uh, it's a secret. And we know we all like to sit around the Shabbos table and say, Israel could do this, Israel could do that. None of us have any idea. So it's better not to talk about it. But in any event, Iran is probably holding the, the Lebanon card in abeyance in case Israel attacks. It knows that it will take a huge battering on the home front from Hezbollah until we can set that aside. So Iran wasn't immediately relevant directly. Uh, in this latest Hamas flare-up, although it was definitely playing some role in the background, um, Iran is the looming issue for the future, and uh, you know anybody's guess how that's going to play out. Rabbi Yaffe, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, essentially, I just wanted to point out that there's a bunch of questions uh, percolating on the chat, so maybe Dr. Gordas could look at some of those too. Well, I'm about to ask him. So, so in fact, so one. Um, Charlotte Zeller asked a question about how you would explain mm. the tension between Israeli and Arab Israeli citizens. And I'm going to add, especially in light of what seemed to be such a positive COVID experience. And the other question that's yeah. here is about the upcoming government, what you, what you expect. Well, okay, do them both quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right that COVID actually... COVID was an extraordinary thing for Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs. Uh, a huge percentage, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's probably 15, 20, whatever, maybe more percent of people that work in the, uh, in the medical field are Arabs, doctors, nurses, techs, whatever. And so those of us, you know, everybody was afraid of getting COVID. We tried to be careful, just like you tried to be careful. But I think we all knew that, you know, you breathed the wrong thing, or we thought at the beginning you touched the wrong thing. It turned out that surfaces weren't so terrible. Uh, you end up in the hospital. The likelihood that somebody of, who's Arab will be taking care of you um, is very high. And it created a sense of great interdependence. And there was a tremendous amount of celebration of the cooperation and the working together of Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews. Where did this, um, where did this explosion of violence in Akko and in Lod and in Yafo and in Jerusalem, where did this come from? First of all, it's very important to point out that it was extremists on both sides. It wasn't the rank and file on both sides. It was the extremists. And I put up a podcast uh, about three days ago um, on my uh, on my Substack, which is an interview with a woman who lives in Lod, who lives in a community called Ramat Eshkol, where she and her husband and two children, two small children live uh, purposely for the purpose of working on coexistence. And to hear her describe what happened in Lod is just literally heartbreaking. Where did it come from? It came from a whole array of longstanding issues. On the Arab side, it came from um, frustration with high rates of unemployment among young Arab men. 
um, which is a result of the fact that they don't finish school in a lot of cases. Uh, it came from a sense of frustration that the Palestinians on the one hand are still fighting Israel and other Arab countries are moving into normalization with Israel. And they feel very much caught in the middle. Uh, it comes from a whole lot of things. And I'll say the bottom line is I don't think we Israelis fully understand where it came from. It was horrible, just horrible. Uh, we have East Jerusalem Arabs on our faculty here at Shalane College, where I'm sitting right at this moment, uh, who for at least a week, maybe a little bit more, taught on Zoom, uh, not because of COVID anymore, because they were afraid to get on public buses to come to work. Uh, when Israeli Arabs, you have, East Jerusalem Jews are not exactly Israeli Arabs, but they're a middle status, are afraid to come to work at a liberal arts college because of what they thought would happen to them on the way, uh, Israel has devolved into a place that is really very sad. And I think all of us are horrified by what happened, and we have to get to the bottom of it and do a lot more work on, on trying to, to fix it. So um, in terms of what happened with Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews, very sad. Uh, very complicated, by the way. I mean, Israeli Arabs are frustrated that there's a tremendous amount of violence in Israeli Arab communities and the police don't arrest people and don't confiscate weapons. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of illegal weapons among Israeli Arabs and very few illegal weapons among Israeli Jews. Um, and people say, well, why don't the police arrest them? But the police say, why should I go into Arab communities and arrest people when I'm going to put my life in danger? When we know from years and years of experience that Israeli Arabs won't testify in court, so it's almost impossible to get a conviction. Now, there's these are very complicated issues that, again, a little headline in the New York Times or the Washington Post or CNN or Fox News is not going to take you where you need to go to really understand this. These are long-standing issues. Um, and but it's it's very problematic. It's very sad. And if there's any good news in this, is that the people that I know that are committed to coexistence are redoubling their efforts in very profound and important ways. The government that we're seeing, which either will or will not come to be, I mean, BB is it's really a scorched earth policy to try to make sure that he can pull away a few people from this coalition, which is a very narrow majority, and see if he can block it somehow. There's only one issue in this government. The, government, the issue is ending Bibi Netanyahu's rule. And you have Israeli Arabs with the Ra'am party, you have Israeli leftists with merits and labor, you have Israeli centrists like Yair Lapid and Yesh Atid, and you have Israeli rightists like Naftali Bennett and Gidon Saar, both of whom for a long time were part of the Likud, Bibi Netanyahu's party. All of them getting together to make this very rickety coalition. They all agree about very few things. They agree about ending Netanyahu's rule. They agree probably about passing legislation to impose term limits. They agree probably about passing legislation that would not allow someone who's been indicted, which maybe Netanyahu has been, uh, to serve as prime minister. Beyond that, it is likely to be a very sort of tug of war-ish kind of coalition in which the left can't do a lot of things that it wants to do because the right won't go along. The right won't do a lot of things that it wants to do because the left won't go along. Uh, and that may be fine, by the way. What do they all agree about? We need a budget. We haven't had a budget in two years. It's a horrible thing when you, you can't make allocations. There's businesses and there's all kinds of important government agendas that are not being funded uh, because there was no budget. There was a very short period of time when Israel was unable to pay its Pfizer bill for all of the, yeah. all of the vaccinations because the budget hadn't been passed. Now, obviously, we paid it because we need to know that if we need an update, we get it. Um, but you, you can't have a country that's a modern country like Israel go two years without a budget. And there's some other very significant political appointments that have not been made uh, in the military and the police and elsewhere that Bibi has been holding up to use as cards to bait people and so forth that can't go on anymore. So basically this government, if, if it happens, and I think it's very open question whether 10 days from now, this government will actually be sworn in. It's a very open question. Uh, and if it doesn't, we're probably heading to fifth elections, which would be a disaster, but that may be where we're going. Uh, it'll probably be a very tense, rickety coalition, which in all likelihood will not survive all four years. Uh, but it's really a referendum on Bibi Netanyahu. Most Israelis, by the way, including in a growing percentage of people in the Likud, want Bibi to step aside. Just say, come on, it's enough already. 12 years, too long. Step aside, let somebody new in. Uh, if it wasn't Bibi, then the election would look very, very different. But it is Bibi, and that's how we have the results that we have. And I said at the very outset, but I'll just repeat, I think the other question to watch very closely here is the threat of violence. There are people calling to stop at all costs. You can look at Times of Israel today, look at the Hebrew press, 
A stop at all costs, the formation of this government. What does at all costs mean? Well, you know, I mean, we remember Yitzhak Rabin and we remember Chaim Lazarov. We know what all costs means in this country uh, and people are nervous and they're right to be nervous. And so I will personally heave a huge sigh of relief if two weeks go by and there's no violence. Um, I will personally heave a huge sigh of relief if this government does come to be because I think it's time for Netanyahu to leave office and let somebody else come in. And then where we go from there, time will tell. So I just one last question. Um, and so those of you who put questions in that I couldn't answer, I'm really sorry, it's a sh short time, but um, Rhonda Jackowitz asked a really important question, I think. Peter Beinart is speaking in our community, not organized by the Jewish community, but he's speaking through an organization called Critical Connections. And the topic is Palestinian rights and Jewish responsibility. What question would you ask him? Well, I won't, I, I can answer that question in a different kind of a way. As some of you are probably aware that Peter Beinart and I uh, did a podcast for a while together. You can find it on Spotify and on iTunes and all that. Just, I think it was called Fault Lines, yeah. um, but it's over. And uh, Peter and I were never friends. You know, we didn't go out with our wives for coffee, but we were friendly. And uh, we appeared a few times, Harvard, Hillel, Columbia, Hillel, a synagogue here and there. Um, and, you know, we disagreed. And what we did was we tried to actually model civil discourse. As everybody understood that he wasn't going to convince me and I wasn't going to convince him. Uh, but he said he was in favor of a Jewish state. I'm in favor of a Jewish state. He cares about the Palestinians. I care about the Palestinians. He thinks grass is green and the sky is blue. I think grass is green and the sky is blue. That's basically what we agreed about. Not much more than that. But we were able to have very civil conversations. And therefore, it was, I was more than happy to debate him periodically. When Peter came out a year and a bit ago with an article that said that he believes, he no longer believes that there should be a Jewish state, uh, for me, he crossed the line. And I will actually say the following, knowing that I'm being recorded. I think that a, a person, a Jewish person who comes out now and says that they are opposed to the existence of a Jewish state, knowing what happened to the Jewish people over centuries, when there was not a place that the Jews could call their own, that they determined the future of that entity, I believe that that makes a person a traitor to the Jewish people, period, simple. I know it's an extreme thing to say, and I do not believe that everybody who disagrees with me is a traitor to the Jewish people. Obviously, people can disagree on the left and the right, and it's all well and good. But in my book, the minute that you come out and you say that you don't think the Jews have a right to a state anymore, after all that the Jews have been through, and after all that the state of Israel has been through, by me, at least, you've crossed the line. And so therefore, in answer to your question, what would I ask him if I was there? I wouldn't ask him anything because I, as a matter of principle, wouldn't go. Um, but beyond that, I don't really, uh, you know, there's all kinds of questions one could ask. What I will do is I'll refer you to an article by Shani Moore, S-H-A-N-Y-M-O-R. He has done, I think, the most sophisticated takedown of Peter Beinart um, ever written. And it's, it's long, it's serious, it's balanced. And so if you're planning on going to this event, which I can understand why you would go, I mean, it's obviously an interesting topic and all of that, but you really wanna know what to ask Peter, find Shani Moore's article online. Um, if you can't find it, ask Rabbi Katz. If Rabbi Katz can't find it for some crazy reason, I'll find it, I know Shani, I'll, I'll get the link from him. Uh, but it's really the most serious analysis of Peter's work on Israel. Uh, read that very carefully and then ask him some of the questions that Shani Moore raises. The one thing that I'll say that Rabbi Katz couldn't offer, but I can, which is that I know that the time was limited and I understand that it's frustrating if you join on and not every question gets answered. Um, my Gmail address is danielgordis at gmail.com. No dashes, no spaces, no pretty little pictures, just danielgordis at gmail.com. Uh, and if you write me your question and say, you know, I was on the call on Sunday, blah, blah, in the, in the subject matter, I will write you back. I make you two promises. I promise you not to write you back the same day. Uh, and I promise you that I will write you back. My wife and I are actually going away tomorrow for a few days for our 40th anniversary. So I probably won't write you back this week because otherwise I won't get to my 41st anniversary. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I will write you back. I know that it's frustrating not to be able to get to all the questions. So um, I honor the, the time that you've invested in this and your interest, and I appreciate it. 
So if I didn't get to something, send me a note, and at least personally, we can have a little chit chat about it. So I want to thank Rabbi Katz once again uh, for the invitation to be with your community, to thank everybody else who made this possible, and to look forward to the day when we can have this conversation in person, uh, and when the news coming out of your part of the world and our part of the world uh, is much better on many different fronts. Can you hear that song? Thank you very much. I did put the link for Shani Moore's article in the chat, and I will include it in the email that I send to the congregation tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, Danny. I look forward to another opportunity to learn with you sometime soon. I look forward to Thank seeing you. you. Thanks to everyone. It was great. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. What link? <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. That was really informative. How do you spell shiny more? Uh, S-H-A-N-Y-M-O-R. I'm going to send it tomorrow in the email. You can look for it there. M-O-R. That was wonderful, Rabbi. It yeah, was real. Really great. And I guess I'm being the age that I am. I can't believe that maybe my maybe Elisa doesn't even know about 1948 in Israel. I might ask her the next time I see her. She might not know it either. It's hard to know. It's really hard to know what kids know and don't yeah. know. And she's not a kid. I know. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Yes, I it's hard to know what people don't know. But yeah, I am going to ask her. All right. Well, thank you all. I'm going to end the call. If you have other questions, yeah. if you asked a question and I didn't ask it, I am really sorry. Right. Thank you, Amy, so much. I'm so appreciative. Of course. Shavuot everybody. Bye-bye.